Okay, hello everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. Let's go ahead and get started. This is Budapest, Hungary, our live stream tour with Andrea, who is going to be guiding us through the city in just a minute. Before I turn things over to her, though, let's go through just a few introductory items. We always welcome people to introduce themselves. So in the Zoom chat or the Q&A, you can let us know your first name, where you're connecting from, and what's your favorite dessert. So we always like to ask these icebreaker questions when we do our in-person tours, just as kind of a way to get to know one another. And it's always fascinating to find out where people are joining us from. And hey, let's face it, we can always use more dessert recommendations. So feel free to participate in that. You can type that in the Zoom chat or the Q&A. And we don't do a Zoom demonstration for these programs. So just real quick, there's usually only a couple things that people ever have questions on. One is the sound and the other is the screen display. So everyone except Andrea and myself will be in listen only mode. If you do want to raise or lower the volume on your session, you can check the settings locally on your own device. If you want to adjust the screen display so that the slides we're showing take up your full screen, if that's not currently happening for you because you see these black boxes that have my name in them, Robert Kellerman, you can make those go away by looking for something called either view or view options, and you can click the side-by-side -side mode. Um, throughout our program, if you have any questions or comments, thoughts, opinions, ideas, perspectives, et cetera, et cetera, feel free to type those also in the Zoom chat and the Q&A. Um, Andrea will be answering questions at the end of our um, program. And let's see. So the, we're Washington, D.C. History and Culture. Thanks for joining us. We're a nonprofit community organization, and we give people the opportunity to experience the history and culture of Washington, D.C. and the world. And uh, it's amazing that <laughs> the advances in Zoom technology we're able to have a big group here joining us from all over the world and have Andrea, who's broadcasting live from Hungary herself. For those of you I haven't met before, my name is Robert Kellerman. I'm the founder and the director of the Washington, D.C. History and Culture Organization. Just recently celebrated our six year anniversary. So thanks to all of meaning the anniversary of our organization. Um, so thanks to all of you who participated in our programs, either the first five years and we were doing in-person programs or the past year on our live streams. Um, just as an FYI, if you're in Washington, D.C. or Texas, we're going to be starting up our in-person programs very soon. And hopefully we can see you at one of those two spots. Um, a little bit about myself. I actually live in between uh, Washington, D.C. and Texas. That's why the programs there are in those two locations. And I'm actually 50% Hungarian. So I'm literally looking forward to Andrea's program. I'll let, tell you more about that in a second. Um, we are having a travel program um, on July 14th. So if you're in the Chicago area, there's a really cool Frida Kahlo exhibit called Timeless that's in the Chicago suburbs. And if you want to come out and check that out, if you're in the Chicago area, um, we're going to be visiting the exhibit on Wednesday, July 14th at 10 a.m. Um, you can find information on that on our Eventbrite, um, Facebook, and Meetup pages. And then if you're in Washington, D.C., we're going to be kicking off our in-person tours later this month. Our first tour that we're having is Jacqueline Kennedy's Georgetown. We're going to talk about Jacqueline's life before, during, and after her time in the White House. And this is actually a guided in-person walking tour, our first one that we've had in, let's see, I think it's been 16 months. We haven't had any in-person programs, so hopefully you can join us for that. Um, we have a couple different dates for that, so hopefully we'll see you for that. And then this program, just as an FYI, is being recorded. Um, if you have to drop off early or if you want to watch it again, or if you know anyone else that might be interested in seeing it, um, we're going to record this. It's currently streaming on our Facebook page, and either later today or tomorrow, it'll be on our YouTube channel, and you can find that on Washington, D.C. history and culture. And so we're off to Hungary with Andrea. So with that, I will turn things over and let Andrea drive for the rest of the way and teach us all about the amazing architecture, history, culture, food, music, et cetera, et cetera, for Hungary. So thanks, Andrea. How are you doing today? How's the weather out there? So hi, Robert, and hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, well, it's extremely hot today in Budapest, it's uh, almost 100 Fahrenheit, but wow. uh, that is actually nothing unusual. So that is how it should be in the summer. So we are we are definitely used to that. It's a, it was a beautiful day and uh, I'm really looking forward to giving the tour to everyone and also to you, as you have also mentioned, and I am aware of the fact that you are 50% Hungarian. So I'm very, very happy to 
also educate you on Hungarian culture and history and everything else. So thank you again for this opportunity. And I'm so excited to be here today. Oh, that's no problem. I'll let you take take this over the screen. It's all yours. And thanks thank everyone for joining so us today. <laughs> well, I'm in Austin, Texas. Andre is in Hungary and the rest of you guys are throughout the world today. So advances in modern technology. Awesome. All right, so here, here we are in, uh, in Hungary, in Budapest. So once again, welcome everyone, very warm welcome to Budapest, to Hungary. Hungary. And uh, thank you for this uh, introduction, Robert. Um, also, let me just introduce myself in a few words. My name is Andrea McKay, as you can see it on the screen. I was born in Budapest. I was raised in Budapest. This is my hometown and I have been guiding um, over 20 years and guiding is not only my job, but also it is my passion. And uh, it is just really a great opportunity that with the help of modern technology, I can just bring Budapest and Hungary to you. And uh, I'm really curious and hopefully we will have a chance later on during the Q&A to find out a little bit about your background and also as Robert was asking, what is your connection, whether you have been to Budapest, whether you have any kind of background. So that is always uh, great to know. But of course, that is also the case uh, if you just have a curiosity for Hungary, for Budapest, uh, if you would just like to uh, know more about uh, our country and the capital, then I really hope that you will enjoy uh, this tour. And now let's go over to Budapest and let's start uh, the tour. Let's start uh, my presentation. So first of all, when it comes to Hungary, uh, there are a couple of things that would come to your mind first, right? And let's just list a few of those. First of all, delicious food, right? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on at the end of our tour together, all the different kind of very typical Hungarian dishes. Also Budapest and Hungary as well is known for breathtaking views and landscape. I'm also going to show you quite a lot of slides during the tour, so I hope you will agree with me on that. We are also well known for wonderful and great wines. Most famous one is Sokai wine. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. And then there is the amazing architecture for which Budapest is especially very famous for. There is all the ear catching music, and I will also talk about that uh, during our tour. And then the quite stormy history. And I really put it in a kind of a mild way, the word stormy, because, uh, well, there were quite a lot of uh, revolutions, uprisings, wars throughout our more than 1,000 years in this part of Europe. And I also would like to um, kind of let you know about this during our touring together. So my idea was to uh, show you Budapest in a way so that uh, the, the reminders of the different time periods uh, will be shown. And this way, also in a kind of a nutshell, Hungarian history will be more familiar to you. So let's start our touring together. And first of all, let's just uh, have a look at the map of Europe and let's find uh, Hungary um, so it's very interesting that when people are talking about Hungary, often they refer to it as an Eastern European country. Some Hungarian people don't really like that expression. They would rather uh, like to be called a Central European country, but you can see where we are, the orange country, Hungary, and we have uh, several border uh, countries as well. So we have Slovakia on the north, we have Ukraine on the northeast, Romania, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, they are on the south and the southeast. And then we have also Austria on the western uh, border. So uh, roughly there are 10 million inhabitants um, in Hungary. It's quite interesting, which is something that I would already like to mention that because of our very stormy history, uh, outside of Hungary, we have another 5 million Hungarian people. So 10 million in Hungary and 5 million outside of Hungary. And I will talk about that also a little bit later on. If you have a look at the map of Hungary, you can see that it is kind of divided into two sections by the western and the eastern section by the huge Danube River. And that is also the river which cuts Budapest into two different sections. And on the western border, you can see a huge lake, which is Lake Balaton. 
And uh, that is one of the largest lakes in Europe. It's a very popular holiday resort of uh, Hungary. I'm going to show you a couple of slides on that as well. And you can see also around uh, the map of Hungary, the different uh, neighboring countries that we have. And just a little bit about Hungarian nature, about the general kind of landscape that you would come across in Hungary. We don't have very high mountains, so uh, it's relatively a flat country, but we have beautiful forest areas, quite a lot of smaller lakes and also rivers. So of course, because of our continental climate, it's changing, uh, you know, let's say nature. So most of the trees would lose their leaves uh, during the winter time period. We have lots of wonderful forest area. Hungary is also very well known for hunting in Europe. There are beautiful hunting resorts uh, in different parts of the country. And as I mentioned, lots of nice streams and uh, rivers as well. And uh, here you can see the highest point uh, of the country. As I mentioned, generally it's flat. We don't have high mountains. Uh, so the highest point would only be just about uh, 3,000 feet. So that would be uh, the highest point, the so-called Kekesh uh, Hill. And if you imagine again the map that I had showed you before, the western section is characterized by the fact that that is where there is Lake Balaton. Meanwhile, the eastern section of the country is characterized by the so-called Great Plain. This is the area which is considered as the food basket of Hungary, and the agricultural activities take place there, and also the um, animal breeding and, the, or, of course, horse riding traditions are also very strong throughout the country, but also there. You can see a typical Hungarian horseman here. Also, for example, the so-called gray cattle, which animal was brought by the Hungarian people from the Ural mountain range from where they originally came as nomadic tribes. So in this area, uh, there is a, a great variety of all the crops and the vegetables and all the different items. Uh, that are sold all over Europe. So in the, let's say, 19th century, Hungary was always referred to as the food basket of the uh, Habsburg Empire, because all, uh, a lot of the food was, was coming from this uh, region. So uh, a beautiful area is also here at this eastern section of the country. And you can see the typical, uh, let's say, shepherd, uh, um, you know, dresses here. Uh, later on, I'm going to talk about uh, the shepherd soup, which is goulash soup. The word uh, shepherd means goulash in Hungarian, goulash in Hungarian, in case anybody speaks Hungarian in the audience. And of course, I was mentioning to you before uh, Lake Balaton on the western part of the country, which is a beautiful holiday resort. It is the second largest lake in Europe and all around Lake Balaton, there are small, tiny villages, beautiful vineyards, uh, wonderful wines come from that area. And as you can see, uh, it's a, a, a lake where they have uh, sailboat races. In two weeks time, there's going to be the, um, the, the most famous one, which is uh, going around the lake uh, in, in the possible shortest time. And usually six, 700 boats participate in this uh, event. You can also see one of the oldest uh, religious institution of Hungary, the Abbey of Tihany, and we kind of overlook uh, the lake, Lake Balaton, and uh, also this abbey dates back to the 11th uh, century. And uh, this area has been ever since, let's say, the 1960s, 1970s, a very popular area, not just for the locals, but also for foreigners. It used to be, during communism, the meeting point of the West Germans and the East Germans, the separated families. This was like the holiday resort where the East Germans were also allowed to come, so the West German part of the family also could uh, visit. Now, when we talk about Hungary, of course, it's also very important uh, to mention, and that is something that we are very proud of, that uh, lots of famous people come from Hungary, lots of inventors came from Hungary, and lots of inventions as well. And very often, people are not aware of the fact, when we talk about famous inventions, I think the number one I must mention is the Rubik's Cube. I'm sure that I don't have to introduce Rubik's Cube to anyone in our audience. So Rubik 
is actually a surname. And you can see the inventor on the photo, Erne Rubik, who invented the Rubik's Cube in 1975. And he came up uh, out with this because it was first a teaching aid. By the help of the movement of the cube, he wanted to demonstrate to his students, he was a university teacher, um, how it evolves in the space and how it turns and moves. And then it ended up at a German uh, toy fair and it became an international hit. And of course, the rest is history. It was and still it is sold all, all over the world. And I don't know if you are aware of this, but there are still international competitions of Rubik's Cube, like contests, and the world record is just a, a little bit above five seconds, right? So just a few others I would like to mention. And many of these we use every day, right? So for example, the ballpoint pen, which was invented by a Hungarian man called Laszlo Biro in 1938. And of course, uh, nowadays it's less and less uh, how much we actually use by, by a pen, by a regular pen. But this kind of ballpoint pen was a huge breakthrough in those days. Then also, we actually take it every single day. Vitamin C, which was discovered by a, a Hungarian scientist called Albert Sengerdi in 1937, or the non-explosive matchstick, which was also uh, invented by a Hungarian uh, person. More importantly, it was also noiseless, right? It's very funny that actually these things were invented or discovered at exactly at the same time period. And then also a completely different segment of life. Uh, the first helicopter was built by Oskar Osbod uh, in the 1920s. Then when we talk about a completely different uh, spectrum, uh, about scientists. Um, in Hungary, the science education has always been uh, of a very high level. And lots of, let's say, world famous scientists were, were originally from Hungary. Part of the, uh, let's say, the sad fact uh, is, uh, which is a result of our stormy history, about which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, that many of these scientists, once they were recognized or when they had their outstanding careers, they were no longer living in Hungary. So here we can mention four of them, out of which three of them went to the same uh, school, Leo Szilard, Edvard Teller, Eugene Tigner, and John von Neumann, and each of them were participating in the Manhattan Project in the 1940s. And then another kind of a proof of our stormy history is that uh, out of the 13 Nobel Prize winners that come from Hungary, and of course at this point it's very important to mention that we are a country of 10 million inhabitants. So comparing to the size of our country, we have a quite high percentage of Nobel Prize winners. So out of the 13 Nobel Prize winners, uh, 12 of them uh, were no longer living in Hungary at the time when they were actually given the Nobel Prize. So I mentioned at the very beginning music. Music is a very important part of Hungarian culture. And of course, when it comes to uh, composers, uh, the number one I would like to mention to you is Franz Liszt or Liszt Ferenc, how you say it in Hungarian. So he was extremely proud of his Hungarian roots, although I must mention that very often he's thought of as an Austrian or a German composer. And that is mainly due to the fact that most of his life he lived outside of Hungary, but he was born in the small town of Sopron, which is at the Austrian border. And uh, in, in, in many of his uh, music uh, pieces, he was referring to his Hungarian origin. So here on the photo, you can see a statue of Franz Liszt from Franz Liszt Square in Budapest, and also the very um, well-known Hungarian music academy, the Franz Liszt Music Academy. Also, when it comes to music, I would like to mention to you two probably lesser known names. One of them is Béla Bartók, who is very well known for his opera, The Miraculous Mandarin or Bluebird Castle, for example. If you like operas, I really recommend for you to, to check out some of his operas. By the way, he died in, in 1945, also abroad. He, he died in New York. 
Uh, and then the other uh, person, Zoltan Kodai, who was also a composer and a music teacher. And he was the one who established and put down the basis of a very special method. It is called the Kodai method. And this is a method that incorporates uh, the usage of the hand signs, do, re, mi, fa, si, sol, a, si, do, you know, the hand signs. Uh, if you recall the, the Sound of Music movie with Julie Andrews, uh, that's where you can see the hand signs. So his idea was to introduce early music education as early as possible, even at the age when children cannot read or write. And so as a result of that, they can really learn music from a very early age on. And imagine that this system, this method is still used in all the primary schools. So for example, from the age of six, when they start school, they start to learn this method. And all that already qualified music teachers can learn this Kodai method in Hungary at uh, a special uh, music teacher training school. What is interesting about the two of them and they, that they were very good friends and they together traveled uh, around Hungary and from the little villages, they recorded uh, and put down the notes of the old folk songs and that is why we have a lot of those uh, still today. When it comes to music, of course, one part is classical music. Uh, the other very part, very large and important part of music is Hungarian folk music and Hungarian folk traditions, dances. And all of uh, these are coming from the countryside life, from the peasant life of Hungarian people. And you can see some of the very beautifully embroidered folk costumes that uh, we still have today. Of course, less and less people know really how to make these beautiful dresses. And of course, when it comes to uh, folk music, we cannot leave out gypsy music because in Hungary, there is a very large size of gypsy population that had been part of Hungary for 600 years. And so by now they are Hungarians, but meanwhile preserving the gypsy traditions, the gypsy music. So the Hungarian uh, folk music and gypsy music both influenced each other. So for example, here on this photo, you can see the cymbalom, which is a very typical gypsy music instrument, but very often you can come across this in Hungarian folk music as well. And uh, gypsy music traditions uh, are actually quite uh, I mean, they are all around today, but modern version of gypsy music is very, very popular. For example, here you can see this wonderful singer that, uh, that won a special award at the World Music Expo uh, last year in the gypsy music uh, category. And again, as I was mentioning to you, even though we are a relatively small country, but in different sections of Hungary, there are different type of uh, folk uh, you know, motifs uh, and, and different kind of flower motifs, leaves, again, lots of things that are taken from uh, nature. You can see one of the, let's say, tablecloths that uh, are the most difficult to do, uh, because once you have embroidered the linen, afterwards you may have to make those holes, you have to cut through the fabric, and it's quite uh, difficult to do those. And of course, folk motifs, don't just appear uh, in, in the dresses, but uh, on all sorts of other uh, items as well. When it comes to beautiful items, I definitely would like to mention to you hair and porcelain, which is one of the most, uh, you know, like uh, world famous, uh, beautiful uh, China from Hungary. And uh, Heran is a small village. It's about two hours drive from Budapest. And in this small village, almost everybody works in the Heran porcelain manufacture. It's very important to mention that it's a manufacturer because every basis of porcelain making is by hand. It, there is no machine made uh, items there. And what you can see on the photo is the very famous Victoria pattern, because in 1851 at the World Exhibition in London, Queen Victoria of England had ordered an entire set of this porcelain with the flowers and the butterflies, and ever since it is called the Victoria pattern. Now, again, we are coming back to famous Hungarians, and uh, maybe it is new information to some of you that the two most famous um, film 
uh, you know, companies in the US, they were both founded by Hungarian immigrants. Again, we are coming back to the stormy history. There were several waves uh, when immigrants went to Western parts of Europe or to the US or to North America or to Canada. And one wave was at the turn of the century. It's uh, actually a controversial fact or a contradiction that it was the time period of great splendor and golden age in Hungary as well. However, lots of people left because of the hope of discovering the new world. And these two immigrants were, one of them was Adolf Zukor, who was the founder of Paramount Pictures in 1914. And then the other one was William Fox, who became the founder of the Fox Pictures, uh, which today is the 20th century Fox. Uh, in the 1920s, 1930s, there were so many Hungarian immigrants in, in Hollywood that after a while they had put out uh, a kind of a, a, a sign on the, on the wall of the film studios, which said, it's not enough if you are Hungarian, you have to be talented as well, right? Because everybody was sick of all these Hungarians showing up and telling to the other Hungarians already working that please hire me, you know, we are from the same country. So it was, it was kind of an, um, an interesting uh, time period. And of course, when it comes to actors and acting, uh, some of them I would like to mention, for example, Bela Lugosi, perhaps you remember his name, who was uh, the most famous Dracula in the history of films, or Jaja Gabor, who actually was not so much famous for her acting skills, but much rather for being so glamorous and beautiful and, and uh, marrying and divorcing eight times and every time uh, keeping the house. <laughs> and then of course, Tony Curtis, uh, who, um, uh, who was already born in the US, but both of his parents were also from Hungary. Or Johnny Weissmuller, for example, who was great uh, in the role of Tarzan in the movies. Or I would also mention Harry Houdini, who was of course not an actor, but also he was uh, from uh, Hungarian uh, origin. Now, coming back to Budapest, uh, no, description of our culture here in Budapest in Hungary can be uh, complete without mentioning the spa culture. Uh, luckily, Budapest and Hungary is very rich in thermal water resources. We have lots of hot springs. So the spa culture is something that is not invented for the visitors. Of course, everybody is welcome to use them, but it's uh, primarily uh, originally, uh, it's part of the healthcare system, part of the recreation. This is Seicheni Spa in the city park in Budapest. This is how it looks from the outside. It's a beautiful building, a kind of a ring building, embraces the outdoor pool section. You can have a massage, you can soak in the hot tub. And this is medicinal water. It's very rich in sulfur and mineral as well. And then you can see the other very famous spas. We have lots of them all around the city, but these are the two most famous ones. It's called Gellert Spa. It's on the Buddha side. It's a huge, uh, big wave pool in the garden of Gellert Spa. And otherwise, Gellert is very famous for the fact that it's one of the nicest examples of Art Nouveau architecture in the city. You can see a lot of these beautiful interior uh, tiles, uh, which was the product of the greatest competitor of the Heron porcelain manufacturer. They are called Jolena in porcelain manufacturer. They have also produced lots of uh, like uh, dining sets and tea sets and figurines, but they came up with their innovations of tiles for buildings, uh, for uh, outside, for like rooftops, but also for interiors as well. So all of these photos were taken inside uh, Gellert uh, Spa. Here you can see one of the swimming pools. Of course, the swimming pools don't have thermal water, but the hot tubs do, uh, and uh, it's all for recreation. Again, when we talk about Hungary and Budapest, we cannot leave out uh, all the uh, coffee house culture. It's perhaps interesting to mention that we consider ourselves as this great coffee drinking nation. However, the coffee was introduced to us by the Turks. Hungary was under Turkish occupation in the 16th and 17th century and Hungary was introduced uh, to coffee at that time. And uh, Hungarian people didn't know first what it was, so they used to refer to it as the black soup. Uh, however, later on, coffee house culture really emerged. You can see one of the kind of cutest, smallest uh, coffee houses of the city dating back to 1827. It's ru called Rusworn Cafe with all the original uh, furniture from the, that time. The other end of the spectrum is the very famous New York Cafe, 
which was uh, built up uh, in the late 19th century with all the beautiful decoration. As you can see, it belonged uh, to the famous um, insurance company, the New York Life, and that was why it was named uh, New York Cafe. It was awarded uh, the title, the most beautiful coffee house of the world a couple of uh, years ago. So when it comes to Hungary and or let's say uh, fame in the <laughs> in the world. Uh, I would like to just mention to you something which is more like an infamous um, record that we are holding, and that is that in Hungary there has been the highest inflation ever in history, and we had managed to come up with uh, the highest denomination of any banknote that was ever issued. So you can see one here. Uh, this is 1,000 trillion pengu. Pengu was the name of the currency in those days. So this was after the Second World War. So it's 10 on the 21st, uh, the amount of zeros that you, you have to put there. And just to give you an idea about uh, how it's still kind of uh, around, uh, I have this framed, um, uh, you know, like... Uh, uh, picture on my on my wall here in my home from where I'm just uh, live to you now and all of these I gave I mean I got from my uh, my grandmother who actually lived through this time period of course the second world war she was with us until she was 99 and a half years old luckily and uh, basically all of these bills are original from this time period. So after this very high inflation in 1946, a new uh, currency was introduced, which is the Hungarian foreign. And this is what we use now. You can just say some of the exchange rates. And uh, of course, on all the Hungarian banknotes, famous Hungarian historical figures appear. In a way, we are a little bit happy that we don't use the euro yet because uh, they, they are actually nice uh, notes, bank notes. So when it comes to Hungary, of course, we also have to mention a few words about the Hungarian language, because the countries that surround us, they are mainly countries that speak Slavic languages, or there is Romania with Latin language, or Austria with Anglo-Saxon language. So you would assume that Hungarian would be similar to these. But I have to tell you that Hungarian language is very unique. It's very uh, different and on this very nice uh, photo of uh, the language family tree, you can see that, for example, English uh, belong to the, let's say, Germanic languages, or it's also called the Anglo-Saxon languages. Then there are the Romance languages, like for example, Spanish or French, or there are the Slavic languages that, like Russian or Ukrainian or Slav Slovakian, and all of these kind of grew out and then they go separate ways from the Indo-European languages, right? So the ma majority of languages that are spoken in Europe, they are called the Indo-European languages. Meanwhile, Hungarian language, if you didn't spot it yet, I will help you because it's by the two arguing cats, you can see a, a very small tree and it's written there, Uralic languages, right? And then there is a small section of Hungarian over there. And you can see that there is an even smaller standing for Finnish and a very small one standing for Estonian. And that is because uh, Hungarian language, uh, we kind of brought with us from the Ural mountain range from where originally Hungarian people came from. And they were supposed to be living close to the Finnish and Estonian tribes back then. So that is why these languages are somewhat related. But believe me, I'm a native Hungarian. I don't understand a single word of Finnish or Estonian. They're not related enough to be able to understand each other. So the bottom line is that Hungarian is very different from all the other languages. Imagine poor children when they learn the Hungarian alphabet, you can see uh, that here uh, we have 44 letters to begin with. And you can see that there are lots of letters that has a kind of a, an, an accent or dots on it. And we have also double and even one tri uh, triple letter like this D, Z, S. It's a J sound like when you say John in uh, English. So it's quite complicated. And just a little demonstration of our language. Imagine when we talk about the camera, right? You can see all the different languages, camera, camera. Maybe there is a li little bit of difference between uh, whether you put a K or a C, but it's very, very uh, similar. 
And then you can see the bottom line shows you in Hungarian, okay? Fényképezőgép, that is how you say in Hungarian language, camera. Or we can just uh, have a look at how you say potato in several languages. It's quite related or at least a little bit similar. And then we come to Hungarian. There is a formal word, burgonya. There is an informal word, krumpli. And there is a traditional folk expression, which is actually coming from gypsy origin or Roma origin. And that's called kolompar. So that's, that's a kind of a proof of how Hungarian language is kind of uh, strange <laughs> and, and unique. So when it comes to Budapest, and uh, we are coming to the city now, and you will see quite a bit uh, of Budapest now, it's a beautiful uh, city of views. We have wonderful vistas from all over uh, the city, different uh, areas. You can see the two parts of the city. The flat side on the right hand side is the Pesh side. The other side is the hilly Buddha side. You can also see a kind of a bird's eye view from the Buddha side, kind of overlooking the Pesh side. You can see the large uh, building on the other side, the Hungarian houses of parliament. You can see the river Danube, how it cuts the city into two different sections. And the two different parts are very different. The Pesh side is more the big kind of metropolitan type, big city. Meanwhile, the Buddha side is the hilly, more residential, much more greener section of the city. So today, Budapest is a big city of 2 million inhabitants. Imagine in the whole country, we have 10 million and we have 2 million here in uh, Budapest. We have 23 districts. And then in the whole country, we have no other big cities. So the second largest city has only about 180,000 inhabitants. So nothing in between. So Budapest is the only big kind of uh, big, big city, let's say, in the country. So you can see that there is a very interesting way of how the, the street allocation is on the Pesh side, straight line avenues, semicircular shaped boulevards, and this is all the result of the 19th century planning and, uh, let's say, rebuilding or building up of the city. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, later on. However, now let's start with the very early history, very briefly, how we got to where we are now with Budapest. So long time before the Hungarians even would have arrived here, there had been already a, a settlement uh, inhabited by the Romans. So the town of Aquincum had its uh, peak period between the first and the fourth century, and it was the capital of a Roman province. We still have ruins uh, of this time period, so from this time period. So we also name this part of the city on the northern part of the Buddha side, uh, Aquincum. And uh, it was a very well-protected uh, area. It was somewhat the northern borderline of the Roman Empire. Um, you can see one of the two amphitheaters or the ruins of the two amphitheaters where the gladiators were fighting uh, in the Roman times. Uh, you can also come across uh, ruins of the famous uh, aqueduct uh, system from the Roman time period. And it's very interesting that Hungarian people and Romans, they have never met because the Roman Empire had collapsed by the 5th century. Hungarians arrived 500 years later. Uh, however, we still use this name for this uh, district of uh, the city. So on this map, you can see the presumed uh, ancient home of the Hungarian people. So this may have been somewhere in the Ural mountain range. And in the late ninth century, uh, Hungarian people, nomadic people migrated towards the center part of Europe and they have arrived uh, to modern day territories of uh, Hungary in 896. This is the time that we consider the conquest of Hungary. On this photo, you can see uh, a, a kind of a famous Hungarian history event when the seven tribe leaders of the seven nomadic tribes had cut their veins and poured their blood into a, a bowl. And by this, they had taken an oath that they will protect each other. So that was how they came here. And uh, in 896, they were led by Arpad, the most important tribe leader. And as you can see, they were pulling their animals, the gray cattle with them. They were arriving on horseback. They were excellent horse 
riders uh, in those days. And uh, in the city, you can see lots of reference to this, to this historical time period. For example, here you can see Heroes Square. And Heroes Square has lots of statues in connection with our history. So in the middle, there's a column. And surrounding the column, there are the equestrian statues of the very same seven tribe leaders. You can see how they are. Uh, they were very vicious, very violent people. They used to say in Europe in those days that from the arrows of Hungarians, please God save us. That was kind of part of a, a, a prayer in those days. So in the city park area on Hero Square, you can also come across other uh, statues of our stormy history. So here you can see seven statues on one side, seven statues on the other side. And they are in chronological order showing uh, the different famous kings and leaders of our history. And this entire city park uh, was really built up in the late uh, 19th century. Here you can see Museum of Fine Arts, which was also built up at that time, because there was a huge uh, thousand years anniversary celebration of this event. So 896 was when the Hungarian tribes came. And in 1896, there was this thousand years uh, anniversary celebration. And for that occasion, half of the city was built up in the city park. Hundreds of exhibition halls were built up and some of them are still around today and uh, to celebrate the thousand years uh, that we spent here. So uh, the late 19th century was anyway the, let's say, golden age of uh, Hungarian history. And uh, you can still see some of these buildings. For example, this is Vojdehunyat Castle that was built up for the Millennium Exhibition in 1896. There is also a, a building here that uh, belongs to the Zoo of Budapest. It's also in the city park together with Széchenyi Spa, which I showed you at the very beginning. And uh, it was also um, something of a, a great innovation because zoos were not so common in those days. It was built up several decades before the World's Fair uh, as the second zoo in Europe already in the 1860s. And today, uh, City Park is undergoing a, a lot of new construction, a couple of new museums are being built up and a very nice playground, as you can see, beautiful trees and flower areas can be found there. Now, I did mention to you the seven tribes, and we have other sections of the city which remind us of these seven tribes. For example, what you can see here is the so-called Fisherman's Bastion. And this is a beautiful lookout terrace uh, that provides uh, one of the, the best views in the city of the Pesh side. And uh, Fisherman's Bastion has several towers, seven towers, of course, to symbolize the seven Hungarian tribes. If you have a look at the towers, you can see that they have a unique shape. And that kind of shape is a referral to the tents where originally the Hungarian tribes used to live. And it's called the Fisherman's Bastion because formerly this area was protected by the Fisherman's Guild. So that is why it is called the Fisherman's Bastion. Uh, you can also see it's a very kind of a romantic uh, style that it has, and it was built up in front of a uh, beautiful Matthias church that I will also show you in a minute, one of the most uh, kind of emblematic uh, views of the city that you can very often see from this angle. And it's also interesting that we can come across the tribe leaders, you can see they're kind of high cheekbones and the facial features, which we assume that that would have been how Hungarian people, uh, I mean, originally would have looked in those days. And if you have a look, uh, one of them over here, you can see that what is going on? Time travel? Is it really possible now? Look at the similarity. Don't you think that he looks exactly like Woody Harrelson? I mean, we have to investigate this this issue, right? What is going on over there? So uh, jumping back to the Hungarian history, the tribes came, they settled down, but at that time it was not a state and they were nomadic people and they didn't follow any organized religion. The big change took place in the year 1000 when the first king of Hungary, Stephen I, uh, founded the Hungarian kingdom, the Hungarian state, and also he 
um, converted the Hungarians into Christianity. So we can say that uh, still today, St. Stephen is the founding father of Hungary. Here you can see also a statue of him in front of uh, Fisherman's Bastion in the castle district in the old town of Budapest. And uh, we really are convinced that it is really due to him that Hungarian people survived because by the fact that Roman Catholic religion was adopted, that was how Hungarian people were able to ask for help uh, from other Christian Western, Western nations of Europe. And as a reminder of uh, his great achievements, the largest Roman Catholic church in Budapest was also named after him, St. Stephen's Basilica on the Pest side in Budapest. It was completed during the golden age of Budapest in 1905. You can see the interior, which has 50 different type of marble from uh, Italy. And one of the most shocking uh, fact about St. Stephen's Basilica is that on this photo, you can see that there is a white statue uh, on the main altar. Uh, but of course, from this distance, it's hard to recognize. But here I will show it to you on the right hand side. Imagine that the main altar of St. Stephen's Basilica depicts uh, St. Stephen, the first king of Hungary. And there's a lot of reference to him throughout the church. Plus, we have the mummificated holy right hand of St. Stephen, which is looked upon as the most important uh, uh, religious item in Roman Catholic Church in Hungary. It's also kept in the church. And there is a special occasion on the 20th of August every year when they take out the mummificated holy right hand and they carry it round on the streets of the city during a procession and it is still going on today. By the way, I would just like to mention that this September, if everything goes right, there will be the Eucharistic uh, World Congress taking place uh, in Budapest. And it has been just announced a couple of days ago that the Pope is coming and is going to celebrate the closing uh, service on Hero Square on the 12th of September. So um, let's just jump a little bit in our history to the 13th century. Um, in the 13th century, we had been uh, invaded by the Mongolians. And the most important lesson that Hungarian people had to learn was that you have to practically um, protect yourself. And the new capital in Buda was set up. On the map that you can see, you can see that it was a kind of a walled around settlement on the top of the hill. And it was uh, heavily protected by a double wall system. And still today, this is the section of Budapest, which we con consider as the oldest part, besides the Roman ruins, of course, uh, dating back to the 13th century. That is how you can uh, get up there. Of course, you can also walk up or take a bus or drive up, but it's a cute way to go up by these uh, funicular cars. And that is how you would overlook the funicular railway and the river and the other side. And once you get up there, it's like a little small town uh, with colorful, cute buildings. And of course, the large building that you can see at the moment, which is the Royal Palace. Now we proudly call it the Royal Palace, but in reality, it has never been used by any royalties because it was built up at the time when Hungary was already part of the Habsburg Empire ruled by the Austrians and uh, they always lived in Vienna. So most of the time the palace was empty. Now the palace uh, houses the Hungarian History Museum, the National Gallery, uh, and also the uh, uh, the National Library. If you ever come to Budapest, I recommend to go to this museum, the National Gallery, because that has the best Hungarian art in it. And the palace is huge, it's massive. Uh, the interior is quite modern due to the very bad damage of the Second World War, but the collections of the National Gallery are really, really wonderful. So uh, next to the palace, we have two, let's say, official buildings. One of them is the uh, office of the president of Hungary, and the other one uh, belongs to the prime minister of Hungary. You can only see now a small section of the prime minister's office. In reality, it is much bigger. So the real political power is in the hand of the prime minister. No offense to the president, but the president is more just like a figurehead. 
And the rest of the section, so like one third is taken up by the presidential office and the prime minister's office and the royal palace. And two thirds of this area is this charming, uh, narrow streets with uh, like all the cobblestones, inner courtyards, little colorful buildings, as you can see. And uh, this is like a small village within the big city, right? It's like really a, a kind of a little bit isolated area because you are on the top of the hill. However, there are many historical buildings. This is, for example, a medieval Jewish praying house. Uh, and starting from the 13th century, it was a melting pot of many people living here together, Hungarian people, German people. There was already a sizable, sizable Jewish community at that time. Uh, and even today, it's a residential area, so people also live in these uh, buildings that I am uh, showing you now. So the majority of the buildings they would have on the street level, 13th, 14th century arches, like for example, you can see it now. And then further above, the buildings would date back to after the Turkish occupation, 17th, 18th century. And often the top of the buildings would be the result of the renovation of after the Second World War, when very, very bad damage was done in the whole city, but also here as well. So hopefully you can have a little bit of uh, idea about uh, how uh, it looks um, with all the different uh, cobblestone uh, sections. And uh, you can also imagine how uh, it looked uh, like after the war time period, although these photos don't even show the very bad damage, but I'm going to show a little bit later on uh, photos of that uh, as well. And so again, jumping back a little bit in our history. So in the uh, 13th century, uh, Buddha, was set up as the new capital. And then in the 15th century, King Matthias, who was uh, a very uh, famous king in Hungary, uh, had kind of established a beautiful Renaissance court in this area. And still today, we remember him as one of the most important uh, rulers of uh, Hungary. And uh, also, we remember him in several ways. All over the city, you can come across this uh, figure of the Black Raven with a ring in his beak because of several legends were going around about how the uh, raven escaped with the ring of King Matthias. So um, all over the city, you can come across this. And of course, uh, one of the most important churches of Budapest was named after him. It's called Matthias Church. You can see the beautiful uh, ceramic tile rooftop of the church. And this has uh, been also very important in our history because this was the church where a lot of the um, coronations took place as well. So it is called the Coronation Church uh, of Hungary. You can see also the, the Black Raven once again. You can see it from a, from a different angle. And a uh, little bit inside, uh, it's an interesting combination, a mixture of, uh, uh, you know, referral to the different time periods. As for 150 years, it was a mosque during the Turkish time period in the uh, 17th and uh, um, 18th century. I mean, uh, let's say end of 17th century, so 16th and 17th century. And uh, also you can see uh, the coat of arms of King Matthias and, and his family. And a uh, little bit going back to after this time period. So uh, in the mid 16th century, Hungary became occupied by the Turks and for 150 years, it was under Turkish rule. Here on this image, you can actually see a kind of a way how Buddha looked during that time. So it would have looked very different from how it looks now because there were lots of, uh, like the Matthias church was converted into a mosque. There were minarets uh, all over. And there are quite a lot of uh, reminders of this Turkish time period in Hungary, for example, in a form of uh, mosques or minarets, not so much in Hungary, I mean, not in Budapest, but, but outside of the capital. For example, these were uh, taken in other um, towns of uh, Hungary. Uh, but in Budapest, there is, for example, a holy pilgrimage place, uh, the resting place, the tomb of Gül Baba, who was a uh, religious uh, Turkish uh, man and arrived here with the Turks in the 16th century. It's a very important pilgrimage place for the Turkish people even today. And uh, also the Turkish spa culture, the steam baths. We, we also have some of those around in Budapest. So you can see a couple of examples of that here. 
And uh, finally, at the end of the 17th century, uh, Hungary was uh, liberated from the Turks, but it happened by the help of the so-called um, United Christian Army that was led by the Habsburgs, by the Austrians. And afterwards, Hungary became part of the Habsburg Empire. So it's important to mention that from the end of the 17th century until the end of the First World War, Hungary was under Habsburg rule. You can actually see a map here that demonstrates how big Hungary was in those days. And we had two war of independencies against the Habsburgs. Uh, one of them at the beginning of uh, the 18th century and the other one in the middle of the 19th century. Just right outside the parliament, you can see a memorial to both. This is the statue of Ferenc Rákóczi, who was the leader of the first war of, Inde war of independence. And then you can see the other one, Lajos Kossuth, who was the leader of the war of independence in 1848-1849. After its failure, Lajos Kossuth went to exile. He never returned to Hungary. And he went all the way uh, to the US where he delivered very passionate speeches about the Hungarian freedom fight. His idea was to gain, uh, um, you know, like uh, support uh, for another war of independence. Uh, Istvan Sechi in, in those days, uh, who was referred to or regarded as the greatest Hungarian, was the one that initiated the construction works of the very first permanent stone bridge in Budapest. Uh, the so-called chain bridge. And uh, in this time period, it was a huge event because before Buda and Pesh, they were separate cities. They were not together, right? And so it was just at that time, at the end of the War of Independence, that they built up the very first permanent stone bridge. And then afterwards, the, it, it accelerated uh, the way how the two uh, sections got uh, to be combined. And finally, we arrive to the time period which can be regarded as the golden age of uh, Hungary and Budapest. Uh, in 1867, there was a peace treaty, a compromise signed by, uh, by Emperor Franz Joseph, and that created the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. So afterwards, there was 50 years of great splendor and golden age. You can see the coronation of Emperor Franz Joseph together with his wife, with Sisi, in Matthias Church in 1867. And this marks the beginning of this wonderful uh, time period. Sisi is actually a very interesting historical figure, the wife of Emperor Franz Joseph, because she was really regarded as in our time Princess Diana. She was very innovative. She did lots of things that no other royals did uh, in, in her time. For example, exercise and watching her diet, uh, washing, uh, I mean, having a bath regularly and things like that. So during this flourishing time, an entire modern European city was built up together with several other bridges. Here you can see Liberty Bridge. Also Elizabeth Bridge was completed, which was named after Queen Elizabeth CC. And this is how it would look uh, nowadays, today. And uh, also this is how the city would look uh, just today. So practically, it was not only the time when the entire city was built up, but they introduced public transportation. It was an, always a competition, especially with Vienna, but also with the other big European cities. So uh, in Budapest, they introduced the tram line as early as the 1880s, and they also um, introduced uh, a decade later uh, an uh, underground system here on the colorful picture you can see uh, one of the most scenic tram lines of the city today that goes on the Danube uh, embankment and uh, so this is how uh, the underground uh, entrance looked and it was a very modern innovative way to travel in the city like underground and it was also done for this Millennium Exhibition in 1896. And uh, this is how it would look today. This is how we call Hero Square in Hungarian. You can see the sign over there. It still has this very cute interior decoration with all the tiles and a uh, little bit uh, taking us back to this 19th century peaceful uh, world time period. Here you can see one of the stops, uh, how it looks uh, uh, above ground, and you can see just the portion of the opera house. This is the stop for uh, the opera. And um, 
in those days, in the late 19th century, as a preparation for this exhibition in the city park, they have built up uh, Andrashi Avenue. This is what you can see in the middle of the photo. The design uh, was following the plans of the Champs Elysees in Paris, and it's a beautiful avenue with high end fashion stores and restaurants, the theater district, the theater quarter. And at the end, it's like a villa section with all uh, the beautiful uh, villas. And if I have to choose like one building to really describe uh, the uh, Hungarian, let's say, golden age, it would definitely be the parliament building. You can see this emblematic uh, shot from the river uh, or from the other side of the city. So um, this was built up as a building, which uh, eventually ended up to be much bigger than the size of our country would have justified. But you know, after all the centuries of oppression, the Hungarian people wanted to show the whole world what a beautiful building they are capable of building. So they came up with a building which ended up to be a four-story building with almost 700 rooms inside. And money was not an issue. Money didn't count. Uh, and uh, I will just show you a, a little bit of collection of what you can see inside. It's like endless corridors, beautiful columns, golden leaves, all the paintings and, um, and um, um, you know, handmade carpets everywhere. One of the curious uh, and, and uh, very funny things are the numbered cigar holders that you can see on the window frame and the members of the parliament, they just had to put down the cigar and then they memorized where they uh, left them and then they could finish off their own cigars after the session was over. And of course, uh, another uh, fact for which the parliament is very famous is that this is the place where we are having on display the Hungarian holy crown and the crown jewels. And uh, they, each of them date back uh, to different time periods. The crown itself is the oldest and it dates back to the 11th century and throughout the centuries uh, there has been many many times when they were stolen or um, somebody wanted to lay a hand on them uh, last time something happened to the crown jewels and the holy crown was at the end of the second world war when they were given to u.s soldier uh, originally with the idea of safekeeping and they were transported to the US and they were kept in Fort Knox until 1978 and because of communism and the Cold War there was no way to return them and then finally in 1978 Jimmy Carter US president uh, gave them back to Hungary imagine in those days Hungary was a communist country so it was an extremely big deal that they were returned to Hungary and it was a very very important event so as you can imagine no US president can ever be Jimmy Carter uh, after this uh, move. So again, uh, when uh, we talk about uh, Hungary, it's very important uh, to mention that uh, in those days, at the time period when it was the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, it was uh, almost just as important as uh, Austria. It was like a dual uh, monarchy. And unfortunately, this very flourishing time ended with the First World War. Here on the photo, you can actually see one of the most uh, important museum on the First World War. And one of the most uh, striking result of the First World War was for Hungary uh, uh, that we have lost very, very significant territories. Here on this map, you can see what happened uh, in 1920 after uh, the peace treaty of Trianon, which was signed in France. So Hungary uh, was taken away two thirds of its territory and one third of the population. And these areas were given to other uh, neighboring countries. So to Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia, Austria and Romania. And uh, so the entire country became much, much smaller. And all these people speaking Hungarian, being, feeling Hungarian, all of a sudden woke up in another country, right? And they became the citizens of other countries. So in those days, the very unhappy people in Hungary were producing flyers. And you can see one of these, actually two of these flyers from those times. The one on the left hand side, the bottom one shows the black section is original Hungary, the map of original Hungary, and the beige color with Budapest in the middle shows you what was the remaining part of it. And as a very interesting example, they put the map of the US 
above and also did the same. So the black section is two thirds of the US, like imagining what would have happened to the US if all those parts would have been given to other countries and only one third would have remained like in the case of Hungary, right? And they did a similar flyer with many other countries. You can see these red and yellow maps. So for France, for example, or Germany or uh, England or Italy, for example. So just to give an idea uh, to the people. So it was a very unfair decision and uh, that actually really set the ground. Uh, well, not just this, but, but the, the whole way how the First World War was closed down. And unfortunately, Hungary entered the Second World War also on the side of Germany. And uh, as a result of that, um, uh, one year before the end of the war, in the spring of 1944, uh, Hungary was occupied by Germany. So first we had alliance, but uh, from the spring of 1944, uh, Hungary was occupied by Germany. And finally, the siege of Budapest started in uh, the winter of 1944, and Budapest was under siege for more than two months. You can see the striking result. All the bridges were blown up by the retreating um, well, by the retreating uh, Germans, by the Soviets, by the Allied forces, everybody was booming, uh, bombing Budapest. And um, it was one of the European cities that was damaged in the worst uh, possible way. Um, you can still today come across buildings in Budapest that would have uh, bullet holes from that time period, although so many years had passed by uh, ever since that time. And uh, at the end, uh, Hungary was liberated by uh, the Soviet um, army. You can see that here, uh, for example, on purpose, they left some of the bullet holes on one of the buildings. And also you can see another one which was not left purposely, but it's still there since it has not been restored uh, ever since. So talking about uh, Hungarian history, I would also like to show you another section of uh, Budapest, and this is the Jewish quarter, which is on the Pest side. It's very important to mention that a lot of those uh, famous scientists, a lot of the Nobel Prize winners that I referred to earlier on, also some of our composers that I have mentioned to you about, they were all from a Jewish background. There had been a great wave of immigration into Hungary from other countries, and there had been a built up of a very sizable Jewish community. And in the Jewish uh, quarter, still today, we have this uh, beautiful synagogue, which is called Dohain Street Synagogue. And this is the, considered as uh, being in the top five synagogues as, as far as size, size-wise. Uh, it's definitely the largest one of Europe. And uh, it was built up in the middle of the 19th century in a very interesting combination of Byzantine and Moorish style. You can see the interior here. It's very church-like, right? With, uh, with the balcony level, with the benches. Even the uh, Ark of Covenant looks a little bit like a main altar. They have originally original uh, 22 Torah scrolls there from the time period from 1859 when the synagogue uh, first opened. So it has a very ornate, very beautiful decoration. And it was built up by the Hungarian neologue Jewish community, which was a new branch of Judaism in uh, Hungary in the 19th century. It's not orthodox. It's not reform. It's somewhere in between, but closer to orthodoxy. So you can see here also the Ark of Covenant and a little bit of uh, decoration. I mean, uh, beauty, it was uh, beautifully restored uh, almost uh, 20 years ago, uh, but during communism, it was in a very bad uh, shape. So going back to the 19th century history, the Jewish community had a kind of a uh, wonderful flourishing time period uh, here in the Jewish quarter. Uh, their idea was uh, integrating into the Hungarian society, not assimilating, but integrating. Um, however, this ended with the First World War because of all these territorial losses, with all this failure, the Hungarian government was somewhat looking for scapegoats and in the way of uh, blaming on the Jewish uh, population, on the Jewish community, they started to come up with anti-Jewish laws as early as the 1920s. And unfortunately, 
uh, it all went further deeper when we entered the Second World War and then uh, from the spring of 1944, mass deportation started also from uh, Hungary. And a large number of the Hungarian Jewish community, unfortunately, never returned uh, from Auschwitz. Today in Budapest, in the garden of the synagogue, there is a very unique cemetery. And that is what you can see there. There are more than 2,000 persons buried out of those Jews that were collected and were here in the Jewish quarter, but were never deported because deportations had been suspended. But because of the unbearable conditions, because of the cold winter, because of everything else, they passed away and there was no way to carry all these thousands of people out from this place. So a special permission was given by the rabbi to bury them here. So it's very unique to have a cemetery in the garden uh, of uh, a synagogue, but this is what it happens. And at this point, I also would like to mention that meanwhile, unfortunately, the Hungarian government didn't protect uh, its citizens, but there were many, many Hungarian people as well as foreigners that did uh, everything in order to save Jews. And one of them I would like to mention to you, Roel Wallenberg, you can see his name on, the, uh, on this plaque. Uh, he was a Swedish diplomat. He came to Hungary and he had saved thousands of Hungarian Jews by giving out fake uh, documentations and passports uh, and so on. And uh, one of the most striking memorials, I think, of the entire city is this, the so-called Weeping Willow Tree, which is in the garden of the synagogue, behind the Great Synagogue. And this is uh, a beautiful Weeping Willow Tree. And uh, it is otherwise an upside down menorah. So if you imagine it, if you envision it, uh, how it would look, it's a weeping willow tree, but it's an upside down menorah. All the broken parts uh, remind us of all the lost generations that would never return. And then on the little leaves, there are engraved names, also more than 2000 names of such uh, Hungarian Jews that did not return uh, from the death camps. And in the middle, uh, the black part is the symbol of the Book of Moses. It's uh, in Hebrew, it's written on the top, whose pain is bigger than mine. And that is a referral to, again, to all the lost generations. And there is nothing written in the Book of Moses, let's say, because it was such an out outlaw situation and none of the written and unwritten laws of humanity prevailed. Uh, so that is why it's empty. So this uh, tree of life, it is called, or the weeping willow tree, it was erected by the so-called Emanuel Foundation, which was founded by the American actor Tony Curtis. He founded this foundation for the memory of his father, who was Hungarian and who was called Emanuel Schwartz. So Emanuel Foundation, together with the Hungarian state, uh, erected this uh, memorial in 1990 for the memory of the 600,000 Jews uh, from Hungary that died during this time. This is how it would look on the little leaves. There is the engraving of, uh, uh, of the names. And another memorial I would like to show you, as you can see, it's very close to the parliament building, is the so-called Sh uh, Shoe Memorial. And this is uh, a commemoration in another way. It is to commemorate the terrible event when uh, in this area there were the so-called safe houses that were supported by the Swedish and the Swiss embassy, and still many Jews were hiding there. And uh, when the deportations had been already suspended, it was still carried on. Uh, and uh, I mean, members of the um, Hungarian Arrow Cross Party, which was like a Nazi party, they broke into these houses, they dragged out people, they uh, took them to the river embankment, they ordered them to take their shoes off, and then they were shot into the Danube. And as a memorial for this terrible event, uh, this uh, shoe memorial was erected. As you can see, it's randomly placed shoes on the river embankment. And I think it's a very, very, um, really uh, a very, very striking and touching uh, memorial. So after the Second World War, uh, as I mentioned, we were liberated by the Soviet army. And then afterwards, uh, communism was introduced. Uh, it's very interesting. And of course, I, uh, I don't have the time during this uh, presentation to talk about that. And, but hopefully in the future, I will have another one on communism. 
but it's interesting how uh, we kind of thought after communism that yes, we want to finish with it, but we want to have something preserved from it. So that is why from the communist time period, we have a place which you can see now on the photo. It's called Memento Park, um, Statue Park. It's outside of Budapest and we have several of these huge memorials that were around on the streets of the city during communism. So they are still there. You can see Lenin, for example, there on the right hand side. And it's um, actually a very popular place because it is quite meaningful to those who never lived under communism and also to the new generation who led, who never lived through that. So there is a Trabant car, which was the terrible product of the East German economy in those days. You had to like wait five years for such a, a creepy little car. Um, and in the city, we also have some memorials that we have uh, preserved, for example, this one, which is on the top of Gellert Hill or one of the hills on the Buddha side is the so-called Liberation Monument. And then we also have, uh, um, yeah, you can see some of the symbolic uh, monuments there. Uh, the Red Star and the statue of the armed Soviet soldier statue was taken down. That would have been too much to keep in the city, but the rest of the memorial was kept. And we also have one in the downtown area on the Pesh side. This is a Soviet soldier memorial just to specifically, um, you know, commemorate the Soviet soldiers that died in the siege of Budapest in 1944 and 1945. And when we continue with the historical, uh, let's say, uh, uh, kind of view. Um, Hungary was the first country that st stood up against the oppression. So in 1956, there had been a prizing, an uprising against the Soviets and against communism. And uh, um, now, of course, when we talk about it, we may uh, look a little bit naive to believe that this would have been successful, but you never start up a, uh, an uprising by thinking that it will not be successful. Hungarian people really believe that it's going to go through. Uh, unfortunately, it was not the case. After just uh, two weeks, the uprising was put down. Uh, and then 12 years later, they have also tried it in the, in the Czech Republic with the same result. You can see how they were like destroying the symbols of uh, communism by uh, destroying the statue or the huge statue of Stalin, for example, on the streets of Budapest, uh, pulling down the Soviet soldier statue or the Red Star as well. There was a really desperate event, uh, uh, the uprising. And of course, I also have to mention that after the uprising, many people were put into prison, many people were executed. Among those, for example, Imre Nagy, who was the prime minister of uh, Hungary at that time. Uh, and at this point, I also would like to mention the roughly 200,000 Hungarian refugees who left uh, during this time, went through the woods and uh, went to refugee camps. And many of them uh, were offered a new home uh, in Western Europe and also about 50,000 of them in the US and in North America. And you can see the, let's say the closure of the uh, communist time period by a very important event. You may recognize this is also on Hero Square, which we have seen at the very beginning of our tour. Uh, in 1989, there was the reburial funeral service of Imre Nagy on Hero Square. And we can really call this as the end of the communist time, because as you can imagine, during the decades of communism, it was not possible to commemorate the events of 1956 because it was considered as a counter revolution. So 100,000 persons were on the square. The rest of the country was in front of television and uh, Imre Nagy uh, was together with the three other fellow revolutionaries was properly uh, reburied, not on Hero Square, but the actual uh, memorial service took place there. And today we have several memorials in the city and of course in the country that is commemorating uh, these events of 1956. For example, here you can see this photo that has these symbolic in large bullets on the wall of this building opposite the parliament building. And this is to commemorate those people who were actually shot uh, during the uprising in 1956 in October. And also this uh, national flag with the hole on it is a real symbol of the uprising. Why? Because uh, we had to use a symbol which was like with a hammer and a sickle, a, a type of Soviet type symbol. And uh, the angry people cut those out 
from the flags. So the flag with the hole on it became the symbol of this desperate uh, freedom fight. So the end of communism was, let's say, 1989. In 1990, we had the very first free elections. And then 14 years later, we entered the European Union. So ever since we are a member of the European Union, we joined the EU together with several other countries at the same time. So with uh, Slovakia, with uh, Czech Republic and Poland. And ever since Hungary uh, has gone through lots of changes, we are hosting quite a lot of events, for example, Formula One race every year, it's coming up actually in two weeks now. Uh, also, we have great festivals, we are here, here in Budapest, the city of festivals uh, of all sorts of like wine festival, for example, in the Royal Palace area, we have one of the greatest music festivals in Europe every year in August. And it started out as a student festival with just like uh, certain bands, but by now it attracts half a million people and many people come from like more than half of the visitors are from uh, foreign countries and now it's folk music, uh, classical music, everything else uh, uh, you can find there. And also uh, another curiosity, of course, the, 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 it could go on for a long time, but uh, the ruined pub district in the uh, Jewish quarter of Budapest, quite a lot of uh, buildings that had been neglected had been converted into bars and uh, restaurants, so now it gives a very funky character and then kind of an interesting neighborhood uh, that we can find there. I uh, did mention to you at the very, very beginning, and we are really coming to the end of our um, uh, tour now, but I did mention to you at the beginning that I will talk about Hungarian food and Hungarian wine, and I already apologize if uh, somebody is really hungry because now disturbing images are coming up. This is actually the uh, famous uh, covered market or the great market hall of Budapest where you can come across all the Hungarian delicacies, all the fresh produce, and upstairs you can also eat Hungarian dishes. So when it comes to street food or let's say market food, uh, the most famous one which I would mention to you is the so-called langos. It's a fresh dough that you put into hot oil, so outside it will be like crispy and inside it's soft. And you can never really have it in restaurants because it's very smelly when you, when you actually uh, fry it, but it's really, really delicious. And uh, when it comes to Hungarian cuisine, of course, I have to mention to you the two spices that we use mostly, and they are garlic and paprika. A lot of the Hungarian dishes are made with paprika, and of course, in the market and in all other places, you can uh, get that. Uh, you can also see in the jars, it's paprika seed, which is very, very strong. And also from the paprika powder, there is a sweet variety and a, a kind of a, a spicy one as well. And uh, Hungarian dishes have a lot of meat in it. So traditionally, Hungarians were uh, out with the animals. They needed to have nourishing food. So they were eating a lot of meat, especially uh, beef and pork. Of course, now it's changing and you can come across vegetarian dishes, but the traditional Hungarian recipes, they ha would have a lot of meat. For example, goulash soup, they used to uh, make it in a huge pot in the open fire and they had put uh, vegetables inside, meat inside, uh, little noodles, even potato and uh, had uh, bread with it. So it was also a high doses of carbohydrate as well. But of course, I would like to mention uh, the beet stew, which uh, should not be, you know, mixed with the goulash. I mean, uh, they are two different dishes because the goulash is a soup with much more liquid. Meanwhile, a beef stew, as you can see, would be without that much liquid and uh, it would be served with like noodles, as you can see it on the on the photo. Of course, sour cream must be on everything. This is stuffed cabbage with ground uh, pork uh, inside. And then we also have a type of a, a, a Wiener schnitzel, which can be also pork or chicken, uh, uh, which is very, very uh, kind of typical in Hungary. And uh, a, a kind of a typical summer dish, which we would eat a lot nowadays in the summer when it's really hot, it's called lecho. And it's, uh, can, it, the closest I can mention to it is the French ratatouille. So that could be a little bit similar to it, but not exactly the same. And Hungary is also very well known for goulash, I mean, sorry, for um, uh, the 
uh, goose liver, <laughs> goulash I have already talked about. So the go uh, goose liver, it's either a goose liver pate or uh, meat stuffed with uh, goose liver. So quite a lot of different dishes. And we also come up with lots of uh, pancake, which cannot, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be uh, just a sweet one, but for example, this one would have also ground meat in it, a paprika sauce on it, and then sour cream as well. So this is like a starter, but it's not sweet. And then also during the summertime now, we eat a lot of these very cold chilled uh, fruit soup. So this is sour cherry soup. We have also strawberry soup, which uh, would be uh, coming very handy when it's so um, hot. And when it comes to dessert, uh, I mean, uh, everything has a lot of <laughs> calorie in it, of course. Uh, this is uh, a, a kind of a Christmas um, sweet. It's called Bagley and it has a, a poppy seed in it. We have quite a lot of different versions of how we make it and what is the filling. This is chimney cake, which is also traditionally coming from Transylvania, which was part of Hungary before. And uh, uh, we are very famous for a lot of our cakes. For example, Zserbo, there is also a same kind of coffee house in Budapest, Zserbo Cafe. And uh, also Hungary is very well known for uh, marzipans. They are all sorts of variety as well. And something which is not uh, a, a, an item that you come across in the restaurants, but in a regular supermarket, this is what you can see. It's called Turo Rudi. Uh, it originally comes from Russia. It would be inside a kind of a sweet cottage cheese or ricotta filling, and it's a chocolate coat. And to many Hungarian people, it's really like an obsession, right? And many people that live outside of Hungary, they order regularly from Hungary so they can have this. And when talking about Hungarian dishes, of course, we also have to mention the great Hungarian wines, the Tokai Osu, which is referred to as the king of the wines, the wine of the kings. And uh, it comes from the Tokai region. In Hungary, there are two harvests at that section, uh, one in the late fall. And by that time, certain grapes are almost like raisin. They mix that together with the originally picked grapes. And the result is a very sweet uh, beautiful, smooth dessert wine. And because of all that areas that I have mentioned to you at the beginning of all the great plain areas where from where all the fruits are coming from, we have an excellent kind of spirit called palinka. It's very strong. The best palinka must have like 50% alcohol and it is made out of plum or sour cherry or apricot. And you are supposed to drink it as an appetizer before a meal or just any time. <laughs> it really burns your throat, kills all the bacteria in your throat. So it's for medicinal purposes, of course. And then there is another one for which is very unique in Hungary. It's called Unicum, and it has 40 different herbs in it. The taste is terrible. I mean, it's, it's a black liquid and it tastes really bad. However, it's really a curing aid for... Uh, you know, like uh, if, if you have an upset, upset uh, stomach or if you have eaten so much or too much. And uh, we are really coming to the end of uh, our touring together. And at the beginning, I have mentioned that uh, there are so many beautiful views and I just would like to show you some of the very nice uh, lit up city uh, views from Budapest. This is, for example, when the fireworks are taking place on the 20th of August. Uh, it's the same day when the holy right hand is taken around on the streets of the city. And uh, it's, it's also wonderful to take a cruise on the Danube River and enjoy uh, the beautiful uh, lights of the city. So I would really like to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I would like to play to you a special piece of music. And this is not by a Hungarian uh, composer, but by Johannes Brahms, who was a German composer. But he was very fond of Hungarian music. And his idea was uh, to incorporate Hungarian uh, music into his classical music. And so he has a series of Hungarian dances. This is number five. And I am going to play this to you. It's going to be short, but uh, will probably uh, put you into this uh, Hungarian mood. And uh, of course, after that, I will be ready for uh, Q&A. And, uh, and if you would like to uh, get in touch with me. You can see all the contact information. You can see my website. You can see my uh, 
uh, yes, from the website, you are very welcome to send me an email if you have any questions uh, regarding any future visit or just regarding anything. And if you are interested in live stream tours, meaning that I am actually walking with my camera and gimbal on the street, you can also check out my tours on uh, Beams Live. It's a very interesting uh, platform and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and I really hope that you enjoyed uh, the, the tour on Budapest and on Hungary and of course I will be still sticking around but uh, for the Q&A but first let's just listen to this music. <laughs> Much for your kind. Oh. Bravo, Andre. That was really awesome. Wow. Thank you. I think um, I think we're all ready to go. <laughs> and boy, um, you almost have to have a disclaimer before this presentation to be careful if someone's hungry, you know, they're gonna get um, really mesmerized by all the delicious food. So that was really amazing. Thank you. I do have a few other follow-up things. Let me um share my screen and we can go through that. So thank you. Andrea, that was really amazing. You are very welcome. And thank you so much again for giving me this opportunity. Oh, no, the thanks is all ours. So, on one second. So, again, this has um, not only been a talk about Budapest, but also Hungary in general. So, thanks, Andrea, for spending some of your time with us. We are recording this program. So, if you want to watch it again uh, before you book your tour uh, over to Hungary, or if you joined us late, or if you know anyone else might be interested, it'll be on our YouTube page. It'll take a little while to get out there, but it'll probably be out there either later tonight or tomorrow. And the name of our YouTube channel is Washington, D.C. History and Culture. And as a reminder, Andrea is a professional tour guide, and this is what she does for a living. Um, she's really been um, challenge with the COVID situation. So if you are um, open to it um, and are able to make a donation to support the work that she does, her information down there is far as PayPal goes, um, feel free to do that. I greatly would encourage you to do so to help Andrea keep these programs coming. Um, just as FYI, so I mentioned, um, this is a personal note, when I mentioned earlier that my family is 50% Hungarian. My dad's 100% Hungarian in Ellis Island in New York. We actually have this picture of our ancestors that's hanging up on the wall. So that's me on the left and my dad on the right. This is a few years ago. And here's a close up. So these were my Hungarian ancestors in the late 1800s, right before they came over to the United States. So 1897. And then Andrea mentioned that she has some other programs that are coming up that you may be interested in. I posted the link um, in the comment section in Facebook and then also in the Zoom chat. Um, I'll email this out as well, but these are some of the other programs that she has coming up in the near future. There's three of them in particular, Splendors of Budapest, the Parliament, Romantic Spires of the Fisherman's Bastion of Budapest, and the Jewish Heritage of Budapest. And let's see. So these are coming. So again, I posted the link for these in the comment section in Facebook, if you're watching there, or also in the chat in Zoom. I'll email this out as well um, a little bit later. Andrea, anything you want to add on these three programs? So basically, they are not like one-time events, but they are like uh, rescheduled at certain times. Uh, so the newest one is the Jewish heritage of Budapest. So I actually go through that uh, section, which partly I have showed during the presentation. So unfortunately, the synagogue has not been reopened ever since uh, COVID. So I cannot go inside, but the exterior and we have a look at the cemetery, the weeping willow tree. So it's a walk in the Jewish quarter. And it's basically this platform uh, is, is, is a platform where anything can happen on the tour because it's like real life. I'm walking on the street and all of a sudden a dog comes along or hopefully I'm not hit by a car or something like that. But but it's it's 
always a little bit different. All the tools are a little bit different because also it's possible to communicate with me through the chat. So if somebody has a question and it's again a little, it's a little bit different idea because here it's not photos, but it's the real life. So it, if it's pouring rain, I'm in the pouring rain. So that's what happens. And I will keep producing new and new content. Uh, so different areas of the city. So it's, it's, it's nice to check out. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you. We'll be looking forward to that. Um, let's see. And let's see. Just a reminder, here's um, Andrea's contact information. Um, again, I'll email this out as well. And then we're Washington, D.C. History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. We give people the opportunity to experience the history and culture, not only of Washington, D.C., but of the world. Um, and if you join us late, so we're going to be starting our in-person programs in Washington, D.C. and Texas in the very near future the two places where I split uh, my time in between. And if you are in the Chicago area, we're gonna be visiting the Frida Kahlo exhibit on Wednesday of next week, Wednesday morning, July 14th. So if you're in the Chicago area and you wanna come out and check out this Frida Kahlo exhibit, you should come by and join us for that. You need a timed entry ticket, but it's, um, it's the only US showing of this amazing exhibit and it's running now through September 6th. So you can either join us the 14th in Chicago with us or go between now and September 6th on your own. And they also have a live stream tour as well. And then if you're in Washington DC, we're starting up our in-person programs. We're gonna be doing, uh, kicking things off with Jacqueline Kennedy's Georgetown. We're gonna be celebrating Jackie's 92nd birthday. So we're talking about her life in Washington DC before, during and after the White House years. You can come see us for that. But today um, we had the honor and the privilege of learning about hunger I actually had there were quite a few questions I don't we won't be able to get to all these but let me ask you um, a few of them hold on for one second just one second Oh, um, so Andrea, some people asked about are able to get to Hungary, like what's the COVID situation there? Are, are um, yes, people yes. outside the country able to visit yet or not quite? So we are really getting uh, to that because like very recently it has been uh, announced uh, by uh, the EU that uh, let's say Europe is ready for uh, visitors, uh, for example, like for vaccinated Americans, it's uh, absolutely possible. However, each of the member states have the right to kind of announce it on their own. So in Hungary, that announcement has not been made yet, but I really hope that in a matter of days it will happen. Otherwise, uh, we are at the stage that uh, the vaccination percentage is very high in Hungary. Right now, uh, we don't have to wear a mask anywhere. So it has been abolished last week, not even indoor places. There are no restrictions, let's say at the moment. You have to wear masks only in, in hospitals and in uh, like health um, institutions, but otherwise uh, nowhere. The cases are very, very low right now. So um, hopefully that announcement is going to be made uh, very, very shortly and then we will be open. Okay, terrific. So yeah, things are starting to return back to normal. And then what about um, getting around other parts of the country if people want to explore? Obviously, they could um, rent a car, but is a train a viable way to get to other parts, like if people want to go to the lake or something like that? Yeah, exactly. So I mean, the, the let's say transportation in that form is very, very good. I really recommend the trains. So just to give people an idea, like how, how small of a country we are, that like in Budapest, if you, you know, get on a train, in three hours, you are in Vienna, okay? <laughs> so basically we are very close. You can go down from Hungary, I mean, from Budapest uh, to the Croatian uh, seaside uh, in a couple of hours. So within Hungary, it's quite easy to move around. So the, the, the lake, for example, Lake Balaton is only, let's say by train, it's one hour, one and a half hours by car. It's, it's uh, even less than that. So it, uh, the distance is, we have a little bit different ideas of distances that let's say somebody in the US, right? When you say it's long, you drive for eight hours. When we say it's, it's long, we are out of Hungary, right? I mean, <laughs> so it's a little bit different. What about when someone visits for the first time? Is there any particular thing that um, surprises them? Like I know when people come to Washington, D.C., they're kind of surprised about how big the mall is. And then also, too, that there's just a lot of interesting neighborhoods, say, in Washington, D.C. What about yeah, any particular yeah. surprises that people have well, when they yeah. come to 
Budapest, things that they weren't expecting to see or find? Well, well first of all, I think, the, uh, and, and this is my experience from the last like 20 years, that most people anticipate a much smaller and much more kind of insignificant uh, city. And when they come, they are blown away by the grandiose city, by the size of the buildings, the avenue, the boulevards, and, and totally the, the size of the city, right? Because it's really a big city. So it's among the, the bigger capitals of uh, Europe, let's say. So it's really a city of two million. And there is a great variety of everything because you have uh, the charming neighborhoods on the Buddha side, all the parks and hills, all the culture, beautiful concerts, whole opera house, the theater scene, great museums, wonderful food, all the spas and everything. So. Uh, what I also have uh, from many, many people as a, as a kind of an opinion that they always wish that they would have uh, scheduled more time one, than what they did in reality. <laughs> more time. Okay, that definitely makes sense. So um, Andrea and I talked about her coming back for um, uh, part two, but we haven't figured out the details for that um, just yet. So when we get that squared away, we'll email that um, also out as well. So we've run in a little bit over on time and I want to be cognizant of everyone's um, schedule. So why don't we end things here? Apologies if we didn't get a chance to answer all the um, uh, questions that came in. It was just, um, it was really, you received a huge amount of um, praise just for your descriptions of things and just all the amazing photos. Um, and yeah, just really looking forward to come, ready to go <laughs> get the travel ban lifted so we can head over there very soon. So awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, again, we hope to see you at some point in time in the future. And I don't, planning on checking out some of these other programs that Andrea is doing myself. So thanks again, Andrea, that was bravo, kudos to you. And thank, um, thanks so everyone. much, Robert, and thank you everyone for, for watching. And it was wonderful for, for me and, and see you next time and, and take care everyone. And thank you, Robert, once again. Awesome, thank you. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your weekend. Stay safe and we'll see you soon.